water. <laughs> I'll be back. So I want to welcome everyone to our last winter learning series webinar with Rick Kurzenberg, Bergen, and Elena Enzian. And it also kicks off Granite State Grazer's next short learning series. It's a four-parter about um, grazing and it's, I'm sorry, I'm all discombobulated right now. Regenerative grazing, not even 101 for the newbies and anyone who wants to get a really good foundation. And it's also sponsored by NRCS. So I'm gonna let Rick and Elena take off. And if you weren't in when I mentioned it, please feel free to ask questions during their presentation. Just put them in the question and answer box below. Great, Michelle, I'll just jump in and, and start. And uh, for those of you, and I think there are some NRCS people on board. Um, I'm, I'm one of the instructors for the Pasture Ecology 2 class, your in-service training class for NRCS employees. And um, we're still tentatively planning on holding an in-person training uh, sometime in late June at Wolf Snack Farm in Freeport. I'm not sure if that's going to continue. Uh, we have an alternative date in September, but if NRCS employees want to participate in that, uh, go. I think it's the NEDC is where you go through to try and sign up for those trainings. It's a week long training. We have a lot of fun in Freeport at the farm. So anyway, I'm gonna talk about rumen physiology and I think Elena's gonna talk about grazing behavior and grazing options. So I'm gonna start um, and I'm gonna throw in a few things just to get the discussion started a little bit, but, and most of my comments are gonna be related to dairy, mostly dairy cows as well. So uh, this is a really interesting study that came out of the Greenlands Blue Waters uh, research project out in Wisconsin. But in terms of grazing economics, one of the key things is they found that most grazing dairy farms tend to be fairly profitable uh, compared to confinement farms, especially for smaller farms. But the biggest reason they had increased profitability was this lower section here, that they found that these animals had longer longevity, meaning that those farms had to raise less heifers as replacement animals. And that was the biggest cost savings they saw, not necessarily cheaper milk per se, but the fact that they did not have to raise as many heifers because their cows would live a little bit longer. And you know the cost of raising a calf to a milking cow now is about $2,500. So that really can change profitability pretty quick on a dairy operation. I also wanna bring your attention to this, which is a, um, webinar series that's put on by our main climate and ag network at the University of Maine and especially section two which is on pasture management and a changing climate. We've got um, Dr. Rotz and Leah Puro and Samantha Glaze Corcoran who are going to be speakers. I think it's a really good session. Uh, Dr. Rotz has done a lot of modeling related to pasture systems and greenhouse gas emissions. So if you can attend those you can go and uh, go to that website that's there as well, if you're interested. So I'm gonna throw a few things out about carbon sequestration and grazing, just to um, throw a few things out there and there may be some discussion about this, but you know, we always think about this as probably being a way to reduce greenhouse gases. And it's one way to think about it because if you're taking annual crop ground that's been plowed and harrowed and, and tilled every year and putting into perennial forage, you're gonna decrease greenhouse gas emissions and sequester more carbon. And so those perennial forage is obviously a better way to sequester more carbon than annuals. But the other thing you need to think about though is that cows in confinement probably have lower methane emissions than grazing animals. And you know the reason is that we can better suit the diet to those animals in confinement fedding a TMR than grazing cows. And we'll talk about some nutritional inefficiencies with grazing animals and dairy cows as we go through this seminar. Um, but you also need to think that, you know, while cows feeding on high forage diets produce more methane than grain-based diets, you know, feeding a high quality forage reduces methane production. So the important part about grazing dairy cows is that we try and produce a pasture system that's gonna emphasize really good quality feed for those cows. And that way we can potentially reduce methane emissions. And then again, you know, those, those managed pastures are gonna result in lower total greenhouse gas emissions than unmanaged pastures. So let's go back to what the topic is today, which is rumen physiology. 
So rumen basically is it's the largest component of a four chambered stomach of a dairy cow. And really it's, you know, that chamber is filled with microbes or bacteria, protozoa and fungi. And the, the real component that these ruminants provide for us is that they are consuming fibrous feeds that we can't digest and turning it into milk and meat from feeds that we can digest. And really the key is the fact that these microbes can do a variety of things besides consuming those fibrous feeds that we can't digest. Um, but they can also take nitrogen in terms of non-protein nitrogen and turn it into protein sources. And that's another key component that is really important when we think about uh, ruminants and, and the ruminant ability to digest those feeds. Um, and I always like to talk about ruminants being the original craft brewers. We're talking about a continuous culture fermentation system. And, you know, there's been a lot of information about craft brewing and the whole emphasis on craft beers, but I think cows are still the original craft brewers. So calves aren't born as ruminants. So when calf is born, it's gonna be born as a monogastric. It's gonna have those four chambered stomachs, but the fourth stomach, the abomasum down here at the bottom is the largest when a calf is born. And that's why calves are consuming milk from that you know, day one to maybe three months old. They're gonna consume mostly milk and it's gonna be digested the same way we would digest milk through the true stomach or the abomasum. But as that animal gets older, we're gonna develop that digestive system to include the rumen, which is this large fermentation vat. Um, the other components of that four chambered stomach are the reticulum, the omasum, and again, that abomasum, the true stomach, just like our true stomach that secretes acids to digest the feed. That is the last of the four chambered stomachs. But in terms of size, it's much smaller now. The rumen is fully developed and is a large fermentation vat. So this symbiotic relationship that's developed between the rumen microbes and the rumen and the cow um, is, is a great symbiotic relationship, but it is what I said, a steady state fermentation, meaning that there's inflows and outflows, and it's really relying on a steady state situation, meaning that when you're feeding a rumen or feeding a cow, you need to make sure that you're not gonna cause big fluctuations in feed intake or rumen pH or types of feed. Because again, it's a steady state fermentation chamber and you're trying to maintain that in a way that's going to maximize the digestibility of those microbes. So when you're feeding a cow, you're not only feeding the cow, you're feeding the microbes. And you need to think about that. The end product of those microbial digestion of the forages is that they produce these volatile fatty acids that are absorbed through the rumen wall and are used for the cow, by the cow for energy sources. I put this picture down here, which is uh, papillae that are inside the rumen wall. And so if you were able to stick your hand in a rumen, um, and there are a lot of cows and research farms that have fistulas where you can actually open it up and stick your hand in, you can feel these papillae. And basically it's just increasing the surface area of the inside of that rumen for the absorption of these volatile fatty acids. And so these papillae, are a good way to, if you could, to measure the integrity of the system. Because if you feed a cow incorrectly, and one good example of that is if you feed a cow a lot of grain, a lot of these papillae will actually slough off and that cow will reduce its ability to absorb follicle fatty acids. And that can really impact a cow's digestive system for a significant amount of time. So, this microbial population is dependent on the environment you maintain. So it's an anaerobic situation. And it's really important that we maintain pH to make sure we have the correct nutrient availability released by those forages that are being digested by the microbes. And again, those microbes can take non-protein nitrogen. So any pro proteinaceous components of a forage that aren't in the form of protein, but have nitrogen associated with them the microbes can turn that into protein. We call that microbial protein. And at some point during the digestive system, those microbes actually get digested by the cow. So we're taking a non-protein nitrogen source, turning into the form of protein through microbial bodies. And then the cow can digest the microbes over time through the abomasum. So there's two types of bacteria that we can categorize in the rumen. There's a lots of them, but the two that we usually break them down into are fiber digesters. So those are the cellulitic. They digest best on high forage diets and the pH is greater than six, meaning that it's, it's slightly acidic or too neutral. 
And then we have starch digesting bacteria. And they're the ones that are gonna digest the grain. And so if you feed a cow a lot of grain, you're gonna have a higher population of these starch digesters, but it also drops that pH to a lower level. It becomes more acidic. And that's not necessarily healthy for the cow, especially if you tip that down below five, you're gonna cause that, uh, what we call acidosis in the cow's rumen. And you're gonna slough off those papillae and the cow is not gonna be nearly as efficient in terms of absorbing nutrients through the rumen wall. So here we are in the interior of that rumen. And I, I put this slide up because it gives you a good idea of what's going on in terms of that rumen. So you can kind of tell here, but most of the liquid of the rumen is in the bottom. And then there's a variety of particle sizes that are, get incorporated in that rumen, but they tend to float up. And then we have a larger, what we call a mat on top. So we have a mat of long fibrous material, and then we have a lot of liquid and grain particles in the bottom. And if you've watched a rumen as a cow is actually digesting feed, you'll notice that the, the large muscles around this rumen will force the liquid up and actually float it through the fibrous mat at the top. And it's really interesting to watch. You can just see these muscles contract and you can see a lot of liquid material go up and then float through the fibrous mat at the top. This fibrous mat is also important because these long fibers stimulate that cow to chew its cud, meaning the long fibers will get eructated or, or go back up the esophagus and re-chewed later on to become smaller and smaller particles. As the particles get smaller and smaller, they're gonna leave the rumen and get digested later on in the abomasin. So here again, you can look at this. Here's the forage mat. Here's the liquid portion. Here are the gases. And this forage mat is gonna be part of the fact that stimulates that animal to chew its cud. So the larger particles are gonna get back up and that animal's gonna re-chew. And the important part of that re-chewing is the fact that, you know, the saliva that animal produces when she's chewing that feed is really important to buffer that. Because remember, the end product of the fermentation are volatile fatty acids. And if we allow too much acids to build up, it's gonna drop the pH of the rumen and it's gonna throw that constant, you know, constant fermentation chamber off in terms of its ability to digest fibrous feeds. So it's really important that we have that long fiber and those animals chew their cud and produce saliva. And I'll show you a, a picture of how much saliva they produce. But the other issue is that we wanna minimize how much carbohydrates we feed at any time. Because if we feed a lot of carbohydrates in grains or corn or other forms of, of rapidly digestible carbohydrates, that's gonna drop the pH really quickly. And again, we want a steady state fermentation. If we can all allow that to happen. So when an animal chews its cud, basically it's taking these long particles that are floating on top of its rumen and bringing them back up and chewing it. And when she does that, she's also producing lots of saliva. And so here's just an estimate of the amount of saliva produced by a cow in terms of the roughage, which would be long hay particles or pasture, long fibrous materials she'll produce a lot more saliva than she would by feeding grains and concentrate or smaller particles. And that saliva is critical for maintaining that rumen health. So as part of trying to figure out how to feed a dairy cow, we wanna, you know, we found that if we feed them more carbohydrates, they'll make more milk, but we have to make sure we feed those carbohydrates in a responsible way to maintain that rumen integrity. So it's really important to match carbohydrates and think about also matching the types of protein we feed. And you know, one of the key things that we always talk about, especially with pasture-based dairy cows, is we wanna maximize the intake for high-producing dairy cows. And so your pasture management skills need to be such that you're taking animals that are gonna be able to go out to that pasture and consume high intake. And I think Elena is probably gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, because cows are limited in terms of how much they can eat um, the two classic ways we talk about that is if they eat a lot of fibrous feed. So if you feed a lot of coarse stem hay, it's going to take a long time for them to digest that. And we think that the intake is limited by bulk fill, meaning there's just so much we can stuff in that rumen. But remember, the particle size is what limits the animal's ability to push feed through the rumen. Particle sizes need to be small before they leave the rumen. So if it's really fibrous and, and long feed, it's going to slow that digestion down, it's going to limit intake. But there's also a chemostatic regulation and we don't get into that too, too much. But if you feed a lot of grain, that's going to shut down their ability or their intention to eat more. 
But in pastures, it's a little different because you've got to realize that, you know, we're dealing with a system where a cow is selecting their own feed. And it's really important to figure out, you know, what's limiting the intake there. Is it the pasture or is it the cow's ability to eat that feed? And one of the other things is to think about, and I love this slide, but it's probably a little too technical for many people, is that when we feed cows, we're, we're looking at this steady state fermentation chamber and we have to match the energy with the protein. And really what we're trying to do is maximize the uh, fermentation chamber to maximize microbial efficiency. And if we have enough energy to match up with the protein coming in, we can potentially produce a lot of bacterial protein that's gonna be digested by the cow. If we feed too much protein, we produce too much ammonia, the cow has to spend energy to get rid of that ammonia. And so that creates an energy deficit. If we feed too much fermentable energy, that's gonna drive the pH down of the rumen. So it's a really, it's a good balancing act. And there's a lot of ways we can characterize different proteins, but I just wanted to throw this in here because I think it's a good description of the fact that we're always trying to create a nice balance between energy and protein in a cow's diet. So, you know, one of the things we're dogging on pasture is how do we manage pasture quality to address some of those issues and challenges? You know, do we have enough forage available? Are we feeding forages of the right um, fiber content in terms of maintaining the good selection of longer particles versus shorter particles? How much grain do we feed? When do we feed that grain? All those come into how we feed a dairy cow on pasture and how to address those. And it's not always easy because if we look at pasture composition, how much protein, good quality pastures can be really high in crude protein. You know, an animal dairy cow, a high producing dairy cow really only needs a diet that's 16 to 17% crude protein. So if a pasture component is, is 25, 30% crude protein, really high amount of protein and maybe a lot of non-nitrogen protein, I mean, non-protein nitrogen, it's gonna create an issue where that animal has to get rid of that excess protein, which creates an energy deficit and it costs her energy to get rid of that excess protein. And then if we look at the energy values of pasture, they can be quite variable as well. But in many situations, we're finding that dairy cows consuming just forage on pasture are probably in an energy deficit and they need some energy to reach their maximal, maximum potential in terms of milk production. There are other challenges as well, whether they're metabolic challenges like grass tetany or um, other components in terms of too much forage in the spring versus not enough in the summer. Uh, water content has always been a challenge. Is, is high water content of really lush pasture limiting intake? Um, there's a variety of things. And, and a lot of times we'll see that, you know, if we feed really high quality pasture and that high amount of crude protein or non-protein nitrogen, potentially animals can lose weight on pasture because they're in that energy deficit and they need to get rid of it. And again, pasture is not a balanced diet. We can feed a pretty exact diet to a cow that's in confinement, but on pasture, those cows are king. They're the ones that are selecting what they eat and how they eat it. And it's always a challenge to try and, and balance that diet on pasture and also figure out what, what kind of production needs the animal's gonna need. Um, so again, meeting energy requirements is a challenge. There's lots of nutritional issues. But I always say the most important thing is trying to maximize that intake of dairy cows on pasture. And again, trying to balance that with the, the seasonal distribution of those feeds, whether it's the summer slump or you know, a lot of lush forage early in the spring, managing that along with matching dry matter intake are probably the two key things. One of the things, you know, these are the questions I get for dairy farmers or farmers trying to get on pasture is, you know, how do you supplement those cows to maintain that production so they don't lose weight on really lush pasture? You know, and how do you maintain reproduction efficiency? How do you group cows like you do in the barn? You know, if cows are out in pasture, you're gonna have separate paddocks for different levels of production or they're all gonna be one group, most likely one group. What happens when the pastures dry up in the summer? How do you deal with that summer slough? And, and will dry matter intake go down? Again, dry matter intake really drives milk production. And will that go down on pasture? And a lot of that depends on the type of pasture and how you manage it. One of the things I always like to do is look at the manure in pasture. And I'm gonna end with this pretty quickly here. But you know, we score manure from one to five. And if you go out to a paddock and you see some really squishy manure squirting out the back of cows, that's a pretty good indication. They've probably been fed too much protein and we need to think about how do we balance protein and energy 
or do we think about trying to feed some longer fiber material to try and slow down the rumen fermentation? We try not to minimize or you know, reduce intake, but sometimes we need to think about how do we slow that fermentation or slow down that digestion in the rumen, especially on really high lush pasture systems. And then on the other extreme is this score five where it's too stiff, where it's pretty solid. Um, in that situation, we probably don't have enough protein. We have too much fiber. Milk production is probably not very good. Maybe we need to think about how we are managing the pastures or how are we feeding those cows in the barn? Do we need to feed some more grain potentially? Um, so things like that. And then ideally this is what you want, which is the good balance of protein and fiber. You can call it chocolate pudding, but for all those fans of the great British baking show, you want that manure to have a good wobble. So I'm gonna end there and I see there's one question up there. And, and would you say the digestion uh, so of a cow is the same for small ruminants, pretty much, except for cows, depending on what stage small ruminants are in terms of their production. Are they, you know, are they ewes that have two lambs or triplets nursing on them, or are they ewes that are just pregnant, or, you know, the digestion um, is going to change and their nutrient requirements are going to change depending on their productive status. You know, dairy cows, milking dairy cows, they pretty have a high level of, of nutrient needs where sometimes during the different phases of other ruminants, their digestion and room nutritional needs may not be as great. Are there other questions, comments? Any fans of the great Bridger baking show? That... I don't hear any laughing, so that's probably not good. That's that's hard part of doing webinars is you don't try and crack a joke and nobody laughs. I'm laughing. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm done unless Elena wants to jump in now. Yeah, unless, yeah, I can totally jump in. You got a great job. I was just checking to see if there were more questions. <laughs> no, somebody said they don't want a soggy bottom. All right. Yeah. That outdoes awesome. me. Okay. All right. Well, um, if there's no questions at the moment, I'll move into my presentation. All right. Okay, here we go. My computer screen screens always flip flop around when I do this. So all right. Hey, guys. Um, so this, I think, will be some good overlap with Rick's presentation. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about understanding grazing behavior. And so this is some pretty basic stuff just to observe and take note of and, um, you know, utilizing grazing behavior to your advantage so that you can maximize that dry matter intake. Um, so there's a bit of an art and um, science to it. And actually I should ask, can you guys see my slides before I get going? I always have to double check. Rick or Michelle can let me know. Okay, great, thanks guys. I'm sorry, Elena, I walked off for a minute. <laughs> Oh, no, no worries. I saw it in the chat. Everybody is saying good to go. Um, so no problem. Thank you. Um, anyway, so there's a bit of art and science behind, you know, utilizing grazing behavior. There's a lot of science behind it. People have studied grazing behavior and we know um, quite a bit like, um, you know, this, how many bites various types of livestock can take per minute per day and what that bite size is and how much of the day they're able to spend grazing. So cattle on average are taking 20, 25,000 bites per day. Sheep on average are taking about 50,000 bites per day. So, um, you know, there's a lot we do know and there's certainly that art side to it as well. So, um, the first thing to really recognize is only a portion of that total plant is really going to be useful to animals. So we may have these great pastures that they look great, but really only a portion of that is gonna be useful for them in their digestion. 
um, and aiding their dry matter intake. So it's definitely something important to think about and that goes to forage availability. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but um, you know, the more we understand how much time and effort livestock put into grazing, the better we can really design grazing systems that allow them to maximize that dry matter intake that Rick was talking about. So the larger the bite size, the fewer bites animals have to take to meet their dry matter intake needs. Uh, so the more forage available and the more high quality forage available, the easier we can make it for them to meet that need. Um, so on the other side, leaving livestock in a pasture where plants are very short limits your dry matter intake and productivity potential because they are not able to take those large bites um, and get the highest quality um, forage that they need to meet that need. So it's really important when we are managing our grazing systems that we think about each bite that animal takes and that it includes as much high quality dry matter as possible. So maximizing that dry matter intake eventually equals hopefully meeting your production goals more efficiently. Um, and obviously there's a lot of factors that go into that more than grazing behavior. But again, it's just a really powerful management tool that um, if you have it in there in your foundation, um, you can definitely adjust and because uh, every situation is different, every animal is different. So, um, and it's just fun to do too. Who doesn't like to observe and watch their livestock in the field? So how do grazing animals eat in order to know behavior? We have to know what do they have to, what tools do they have to eat and um, actually graze? So cattle are, they have wide muzzles, teeth that point forward and stiff lips. So they have the ability to use that long tongue to reach around and pull pasture plants into their mouths efficiently. And they can take really big mouthfuls uh, to fill their room in as quickly as possible. So in a well-managed system, uh, due to their anatomy, they typically won't graze down much lower than two inches. Granted, we don't want to allow them to get there, but um, you know, it's just something about cattle um, with their anatomy. They're not able to like really bite down on things. Um, and it also, you know, allows them, their anatomy to be a little bit less selective compared to small ruminants. Um, so they have much nar more narrow mouths, more flexible lips, um, and they can definitely graze more uh, selectively. Goats are certainly more efficient browsers than cows and sheep, and they can be even more selective than sheep, especially at low stocking densities. Uh, so if pastures are managed uh, with goats in larger paddock sizes, the results can be significant overgrazing of their favorite plants. Um, sheep, on the other hand, are a little bit between goats and cows. They can browse and graze, um, but their mouth design really allows them to graze uh, pastures much shorter than cows usually do. So again, when poorly managed, sheep can damage pasture plants uh, pretty well too. Um, and then I did add in horses as well, and I'm not gonna focus so much on them, but I do know we had a presentation uh, while a few uh, sessions back about equine grazing management. And the reason horses can be so um, tough on pasture or just really efficient at grazing is because they do have those lower and upper teeth so they can bite off those plants between their teeth and really get down to that soil sur surface if they are allowed to. Um, and, you know, they're a lot more selective. So I think I said, and it says on the slide, small ruminants and certainly horses have a lot more selectivity than uh, say cattle do. Okay, so how do they learn what to eat? Um, grazing itself is, you know, what they eat is a learned behavior. Um, they first get exposure to the flavors of different plants and forages through the amniotic fluid and gestation. And that continues following the birth and the consumption of milk. 
And then definitely a big part of how they learn what to eat is by watching their mothers and older animals in the herd. You know, they're going to tend to eat and try those things. It's very rare that they might venture out and try something on their own. Um, as a whole herd, you might see that happen, but typically it's definitely a learned behavior. And again, thinking about this, you can use that to your advantage. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, experience. Um, so they will sample new forages in small quantities, but if they become sick or it has a gross texture or something, they'll definitely avoid it and limit what they eat of that particular plant. And certainly the senses, taste being the most important is how they learn what to eat. Smell really supplements that. Um, if something tastes gross, any undesirable or unwanted forage is usually discarded before even being swallowed. Um, and that, although they only see in black and white, sight does allow them to distinguish between different plant groups. So um, they can see various shades of gray. And then thinking about when do animals graze? Um, they sort of divide the grazing period, I guess, or their day, it's a nice day, divided between grazing, ruminating, and resting. So throughout all of that, they're going to be grazing between seven to 12 hours a day. And um, that also includes their search time to find the forage that they want to eat. Uh, and then there are typically two major grazing periods for when they graze. Um, usually at sunrise uh, is going to be their first major grazing period, and that'll be around three to five hours. And then late afternoon is their no another major grazing period where they are consuming a lot of forage. They're not as easily distracted in the morning and the late afternoon, and that is like their main meal time. Um, and so that grazing cycle tends to be pretty consistent. There are things that will um, interrupt that that I'll mention. Um, but then, of course, they're going to have short, less regular periods throughout the day as well, midday, nighttime grazing. And again, um, that's sort of influenced by um, weather and other things as well. And then how do animals actually know where to graze? Um, obviously, if left to their own devices, it's no surprise that any livestock species will go for their favorite things, like kids at the candy bar. They're going to eat the candy first and totally avoid the chalk or the um, broccoli. I don't think they'd avoid chocolate. I wouldn't. Um, and so they're going to go for their favorite things first, the things that are most palatable. And then they're also going to go for quantity. What can they really lap up or consume a lot of? Because too, you know, if you think about it, they are prey animals. So their their goal is to eat as much as they can in case you know something comes after them and they have to go into flight mode and and they might not be able to eat for a bit. So, um, anyways, they're rarely observed in the same location for more than two days if again if just like left to do their own thing um, in pastures where forage quantity and quality vary um, there have been observations that indicate cattle may not return to sites with that low quality forage for as long as 21 days or after they graze and kind of take out an area um, so they go where the good stuff is. They can kind of differentiate between the quantity and quality based on what they're consuming and how it's meeting their nutritional needs. And they also utilize spatial memory. So um, reference memory, which is basically long-term and then their working memory, which is their short-term. And that working memory, uh, livestock utilize it as a way to remember locations that have been recently depleted in the last eight hours. Um, and then they use that reference memory to remember locations of loca actual locations of food and the availability for um, at least 20 days. Um, and they can store that memory. So um, with that in mind, they kind of get this um, survey going of what the land is. So uh, they could have difficulty adjusting to new foraging environments, even if the new location has plenty of food. So say you do get in a new herd, um, maybe the forage um, species are a little bit different than where they came from. That's going to take some time for them to adjust to. 
Um, and what do grazing animals want? So here is kind of getting into what the pastures have and how can we utilize grazing behavior to give them what they need and want. Um, like I said before, they want that green plant material. They want the candy. It's the most palatable and it tastes the best. So they're gonna prefer those new green leaves um, over the stemmy dry stuff. So they always go for that green leafy plant material and then the older green leaves, green stems, dry leaves, and then um, those dry stems. And again, that green stuff is more palatable. So where Rick said, if you've got that lush pasture, um, you can often see them become more energy uh, deficient. They can really start to lose weight on that lush pasture because they're just hunting for all that leafy green stuff um, and sort of leaving behind any other things that could provide them with more energy. Um, and so that palatability is a big thing. And then there's this thing of like nutritional wisdom. And I put a question mark there because from what I've read, there isn't a any necessarily scientific evidence for it, but there is the theory that livestock will select forages based on the content of protein, energy, or other nutrients. So it's sort of this instinctive selection of plants based on what their nutritional needs are. And I think there is a lot of truth to it, especially if you watch your animals. And again, like feel free to add in the comments that, like your experiences and what you've seen your uh, livestock do as well. Um, and then the final thing, forage availability. So forage availability is a really important part of grazing behavior and animals getting what they need because um, it's forage availability isn't just the amount of plant material growing in a pasture. It's the part of the plant material that the animal will choose to eat and is available to them and is going to fill a need. Um, or their digestive needs and, and they're able to travel and find it as well. So they can definitely be very selective. They're gonna prefer forages that have that higher probability of um, being leafy and green. And um, there's a higher probability of them being grazed and having more bites removed in that visit to those leafy areas. Um, and they're gonna go back to those far before they would ever um, graze any other forages. So if that leafy stuff is available, um, they're going to be pretty selective with those. And once those are used up, they might not even look to the, the more mature stuff. So that's where you can start to see some variability. Again, this is if they're left to their own devices and just out there grazing in the field. So what can influence grazing behavior? Bringing it back continuing to talk about forage availability. Um, so the less time that is spent grazing when forage is plentiful and grazing is good. So when there is plenty forage availability, um, there's a lot less time spent um, for them grazing because like I said before, they're able to eat things in large quantities and um, the, the grazing is good and everything's uh, happy for the animals. But um, more time is spent grazing when the quantity and quality of pasture is limited. So as forage availability is decreased, animals are actually going to spend more time grazing because they need to consume more in order to fill their rumens and meet that need. Um, so similarly, they're going to spend more time when stocking rates are high because that's increased competition. And it can work against you if that pasture is short. Um, so if, if there is a high stocking rate, your pasture isn't providing that forage availability for them, they're gonna spend a lot of time grazing and competing with not, one another and potentially knocking back that pasture a bit. Um, so that demand or high selectivity for that limited green material can increase that grazing time. Um, and then if that green material is present, animals will spend more time looking for it and could stop grazing those mature forages, like I said before. Um, also, if cattle in particular, I mean, sheep and goats are those good browsers, but if they are forced into a situation where they do have to browse and that forage availability is decreased, um, they're gonna end up eating less because they're just not physically equipped to select only tender leaves 
And so this can modify their grazing behavior a little bit. And something you might see as well in their grazing behavior as a result of different management systems, um, you might see some patch grazing and that can be observed if there's a lot of variable forage availability in a pasture. Um, and patch grazing occurs basically when there is close repeated grazing of one area and um, then small patches near it will go completely untouched. Um, so again, that's pretty prevalent with high plant density and productivities in, in an area where there's um, other species with fair palatability. Um, and it can also happen in areas where there's high animal dropping. So this is more common in cattle where they make manure, they're not gonna end up grazing those areas. Um, sheep and goats don't seem to care quite as much, but you can see that happening as well um, as far as grazing behavior. Um, supplemental feeding can influence that behavior. Uh, the time of day, if that's if you are supplementing feed. Um, so the time of day the feed is offered can affect their behavior and performance in terms of grazing. And there's some research that showed that better performance was observed in steers fed in the early afternoon versus those fed early in the morning. So the idea there is if you are gonna supplement feed, you wanna try not to disrupt that major grazing period um, because it takes them out and distracts them of their major forage consumption time to come have some supplemental feed. And then, as I mentioned before, weather is something that's gonna influence their behavior. Um, as it gets hotter and humid, um, you might see grazing decrease or an, and nighttime grazing may increase when it's hot out. And so as you know, the mornings get hotter, it gets hot earlier on, animals are gonna seek that shade earlier in the day instead of taking the time to, to graze. So finally, you know, um, it's really all about the power of observation. Using behavior to our advantage when we're grazing um, can be a really great tool. Um, so, you know, how, what, the so what? What is the so what here? So we know that animals do these things. Um, you know, you can use it to your advantage to make decisions about your grazing plan just by observing what the animals are doing. So maybe, you know, if you find there's a lot of patchy areas or they're just starting to be really selective, that will influence your decisions in stocking rates and paddock size, um, perhaps your grazing duration. Um, if you notice that, um, you know, your animals are sort of beating on each other and things are maybe too competitive, that might be a sign that, some animal groupings need to occur. Um, you find that if you're doing supplemental feeding and they're, they're just not grazing as much after that, it might be an opportunity to change things up. Um, and then, you know, you can also teach them to eat weeds. Um, cows eat weeds is a, is a great resource. We had um, a presentation about this not too long ago at the Granite State Grazers Annual Grazing Conference. And um, yeah, so using the fact that they learn to eat um, certain forages from their mothers, you can certainly incorporate weeds into their diet, which I'm sure many of us struggle with weeds on the farm, um, as long as they're not toxic, of course. But um, yeah, so, so really using um, grazing behavior to decrease selectivity and maximize dry matter intake um, to maximize production potential of your animals and your pastures. Again, is a, it's a pretty cool tool and, and there's a lot to it. And I definitely only scratched the surface with it, but um, that is all I have for you guys. And I would definitely be curious to see what other folks think, what their experiences are, because um, I definitely don't know at all. So I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. Eleni, do you see the questions? I do, yeah. There's some questions and chat stuff. Oh, Bill, um, well, in the questions, sheep manure scores are based on plots to hand grenades to pellets. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Okay, let me see. 
Any idea how many bites per day goats take? I actually didn't find that. I don't know if anybody else knows. I'd imagine it is maybe similar to sheep, but perhaps a little less if they're not, if they're doing more browsing. But that would be my guess is that it might be similar to, to sheep. Just reading through the chat. Oh, cool. This makes so much sense based on what I'm observing in my herds. Great. <laughs> I don't know if I missed any others. I was going to add one thing that that yeah. you know it really is an observation thing. You know, and watching your animals and what they do, where they go. You know, what do they prefer? And and one of the things I've noticed is that you know we always have this debate about should you be clipping pastures or not clipping pastures. Yeah. And one of the things I've noticed that if you clip your pastures and you clip it a certain way, and cows go back and graze that, you know, two or three weeks later, a lot of times if you've clipped it and there's a lot of stubble sticking up, they get this ouch factor where they don't want to graze because of the stubble sticking up. So mm -hmm. that's a it's just an observation you see sometimes when you're watching those animals graze and. Are they avoiding those areas where there is that stubble and causing that decrease in intake? I've watched my sheep selectively nibble the seed heads before going after the leaves in unclipped pasture. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Like the things you can just learn from them. And, and again, it's just, it does make a lot of sense. And it's a perfect way to make decisions about um, your grazing plan and, and how to set up fencing and um, for those of you that are with NRCS, it's a great way to, you know, work with your farmers and understanding some of this kind of stuff. What breed is good for meat type? In terms of sheep or goats? I'm not a sheep or goat expert. I should preface say that. <laughs> So if you can just elaborate on what breed is good for meat type. Um, oh, goats. Oh, geez. Yeah, I really don't know my goat breeds at all. <laughs> Boars, are they, are they a popular meat breed? Yeah, okay. Somebody said boar goats. Kiko, great. So I, I at least know that one. <laughs> um, yes, Doc Perkins used to tell us not to put our goats out to pasture until at least four inches to avoid parasites. Yeah, so with sheep and goats, parasite management is a huge challenge. And I know the Granite State Grazers, we've talked about this in past presentations and there's so many awesome resources out there, but uh, grazing management can really help um, with that as well. And yeah, those parasites tend to not hang much above three inches supposedly, but it's not a foolproof situation. Ooh. So there's a question about water and water placement. Um, is the, the biggest thing that I find with water is one, you know, if they have to travel a long way to get water, there's an energy deficit associated with that travel. So if they go all the way back to the barn to get water, you know, that, all that walking does add up. But the biggest part of, of moving water troughs with the cows or animals with the paddocks is manure distribution. You get a much better manure distribution throughout the paddock if you keep your water troughs in various places and, and have them, you know, they're gonna hang out and, and poop near the water trough. So the more the water trough gets moved and brought along with the paddocks, then the better manure distribution. Mm, definitely. Do you have any advice on succession grazing sheep after cattle? I don't know if I necessarily have great advice on that because I don't have a ton of experience. Bill says, do it, it's great. It, yeah, so I have heard it's definitely um, really great for sure. Um, I just don't know as much about the benefits. Maybe you do, Rick. Well, there's a, there's a lot of work done at multi-species yeah. grazing and, you know, you can add chickens into the mix if yeah. you want to as well, but, but yeah, anything that they're going to all graze at different heights, like you said, Elena, and, and so trying to maximize pasture utilization and, 
and also trying to take into account which which species of animal has the highest nutritional need at that certain time may mm -hmm. influence how you move those cows around. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely there's so much info about it. It's just not one of those areas I've dug into too much yet. But I do know there's benefits from the parasite side of things too, which is pretty appealing for sheep producers and goat producers to add that multi-species grazing in for again for a parasite management perspective. So Elena, it looks like there's two more, three more questions, two with the Q&A and one with the chat. Okay. Um, okay. I know there will be a webinar in clipping. I don't know if there will be a webinar in clipping or not, but Joel Salatin talks about the right height range for forage being teenager. What's a good strategy for clipping during the rapid growth of spring if it gets too tall? Is that something I should worry about as a new cattle or owner or just stick to watching them? Yeah, so as far as clipping goes, um, well, like Rick said, I mean, it can, it can be really beneficial. And I, I know a lot of farms that do back mow afterwards, especially in that flush. However, you know, it could bite you in the end if they don't want to um, clip or if they don't want to, you know, go through that um, after you've clipped it. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Rick? It, it's a hotly debated topic and how, you clip, how you clip is also, are you going to use a, a flail mower? Are you going to use a bush hog? Are you going to use a sickle bar? How high do you mow? you know after those there's lots of going into that and i think one of the things you you do want to think about is you know some of the flush you get in the spring you need to take off as a hay crop and then come back in your pasture system during the summer slump and i'm not sure if that makes a difference to the questionnaire or not but i think it's important to realize that you know the number of paddocks you need in the summer is probably a lot larger than the number of paddocks you need in the beginning of may so um, you know, taking some of that feed as conserved feed and then putting it into a pasture system is probably the easiest way to handle that. But, but clipping is a debated topic. Um, I, some of it's related to weeds, trying to weed control, you know, weeds that are right. going to seed, things like that. Um, sometimes I've seen people clip before they turn the animals in to try and get better utilization. And lots of different topics there and I'm not sure I can say what's the best and I think it's based on your observation of how well they utilize the feeds available. What other questions do we have? Yeah, I think the most, the place where I've seen mowing the most common is to manage those weeds more so than necessarily cutting back your pasture. And, and, and I think if you do have a lot of, of pasture that's not consumed, that means you're probably not sizing your paddocks correctly, meaning you're not getting good utilization. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would definitely agree with that. It's an opportunity to sort of readjust your stocking rates and resize your paddocks maybe. Maybe. There's a question on how much available shade in a paddock makes a difference in grazing behavior. Mm, another difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> it's a tough audience today. I know. Well, so, you know, I, this is me, like shade is really important, but it's not always available. And the other thing that can hurt you is, you know, they're all just going to wad up under your shade. So, then, you know, moving, can you have a movable shade structure, you know, to sort of move them around with that? So Rick, I don't, I seemed like you were going to add something, but I mean, shade, I, shade is really important, but sometimes it's not always realistic for folks. You know, I, I, I go around and around on this topic. I'm, I'm not a 
coming from the plant perspective and the pasture perspective, shade just creates problems um, because of the fact that, you know, what Elena said, they're going to crowd under the trees, they're going to defecate there, they're going to destroy the sward underneath those animals or under those trees. Um, you know, from an animal welfare perspective, I'm saying if, it, if you've got problems thinking it's too hot, you know, I work with a lot of organic dairy farmers and if that situation occurs, they graze at night and have them in the barn during the day and minimize the need for shade. So it's, it's you know, and, and in Maine, how many days do they really need shade? I'm not sure there's a huge number of days in Maine during the summer when they need shade. Right. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, those really hot days, you know, can you plan around, like, can you work your grazing plan around so that it is in an area that's maybe a little cooler, or has better breeze, or I don't know, you know, is that possible to, to do? Because I know certainly with, with sheep, even with the Katahdin, you know, whether they have wool or not, they get super hot and your black cattle are going to get really hot. And heat stress is a pretty, you know, that's going to hurt your production for sure. Um, so it is a tough, it's a tough one. Yeah. And, and flies as well. You're yeah. going to see animals really clump up if there's a really high fly problem. And so that's the other issue I see in a lot of, of cattle is that, you know, if fly control is not good and you know, you're going to run into the fact that those cows aren't going to eat, they're going to stand together and they're going to clump right up. Yeah. So are there any good resources or books that you can turn to for multi-species species grazing? Um, I wonder, I mean, has, uh, I wonder if the art and science of grazing has a little bit of info in there, but I don't know how detailed it is. That's a book by Sarah Flack, but I don't think there's too much in there about really like the details of multi-species grazing. Honestly, I, I can't recommend anything in particular as far as resources, but um, there's probably a lot of different extension sites that provide some info on it, I would imagine. Um, but if you guys out there, there's a bunch of you out there, if you have any suggestions or resources for multi-species grazing, feel free to throw it out there. I know I've done like a little research on it and have found articles on various, like, I, I couldn't tell you where exactly, but. Yeah, actually, that might be at ATRA. Um, I think they do have a publication on multi-species grazing. And yeah, Cornell Small Farms is another great resource. Any other questions? So I see one, and if you scroll up in the chat to 120, I'm not quite sure what he's asking. So I'm gonna let you handle it. Um, what time must we pasture a grazer sheep or other small ruminants? Do you mean, uh, sorry, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, do you mean what time of day should you be pasturing your small ruminants? If you don't mind just expanding on that question a little bit, that would be great. And if not, certainly could reach out to us as well. <laughs> sure, feel free to email any questions. It's probably the easiest way to get a hold of us nowadays is email. For sure.
We may have lost him. <laughs> well, I hope this was useful for people. And again, you know, reach out to Elaine or myself and hopefully we can get some questions answered that come in later. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'm going to start to close down, but I just want to thank everyone who's come to any of our webinar series this winter. We couldn't have done it without you and our partnering organizations. Next week, the continuation of the NRCS training series, it's going to shift to 9 a.m. It's still going to be on Wednesdays, but it'll be at 9 a.m. The next one on April 7th is about grass growth and nutrition, so it's just going to continue what we all learned today. Thank you again, and you can go to grazenh.com to register for all of our series. And just to let everyone know, pretty soon in the next week or so, we are going to be launching our YouTube channel, and we'll have all the recordings from the Winter Learning Series and then the NRCS up on them for viewing. So thank you so much, and have a great day. Bye-bye. And thank you, Elena.